windshields are composed of a carpet. This is a plastic carpet that has these plastic grass blades, and they're cushioned with infill material typically made of recycled rubber tires. Each field utilizes approximately 40,000 tires, ground up tires, for a football field size field. Used tires are very difficult to dispose of. Um, many states prohibit them in landfills or for incineration because of their potential release of toxic chemicals into the air and groundwater. We're trying to get rid of these tires every way we can. So we've tried all kinds of things. We dumped them off the coast of Florida thinking that we would make an artificial reef out of them. So we dumped tons and tons and tons of them down there and then all of a sudden we realized that the reefs were dying and that there was no marine life in the area at all. So now they're dredging all these things back up again. I have to go somewhere else with them because these are really toxic, toxic products. These were never intended to be used in places where our children play. Hazardous chemicals in tires. Examples of chemicals of concern. And this is an incomplete list, but it's a list of about 25 of these chemicals of concern. I want to talk a little bit about cadmium. This is a human carcinogen. It is a heavy metal. We are also finding lead in these fields, another metal. Um, but if you look at these chemicals and you look at the potential health impacts, we're talking about human carcinogens, corrosive, acutely toxic respiratory eye irritants, human carcinogens again, neurotoxins, neurotoxins, endocrine disruptors, um, and carcinogens again. This seems to be where we are. We are really concerned about whether or not exposure to these chemicals is going to cause cancer in our children down the road. Now I gave a talk in Bronxville um, with a pediatrician from Mount Sinai School of Medicine and I asked him when he was giving his presentation and there was an opportunity for questions um, about the, the new discovery that we have these young players, both in high school and in college now, who have been exposed for approximately 10, 12 years, depending on when they started playing, you know, sports on, you know, municipal and school fields. And he was talking about the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and leukemia. And I asked him, would you see a blood cancer like this sooner than a solid tumor? And he said, absolutely. So we are just now beginning to see the first wave of cancers. And we're seeing it first in soccer goalies, because these are the kids who are diving for the ball during practices, during games. And when they dive, as you, if, if you've ever done this, when you kick that field, you'll see this spray of the dust and the rubber crumb come up. And every time a soccer goalie dives, it gets in their face, in their mouth, in their noses, and so they are literally ingesting the dust and these, and these little tiny particles. And so we have a really interesting um, data collection going on across the country. Um, it started out with about 38 players. 34 of the 38 reported were soccer goalies. The numbers are now in the hundreds as the data continues to be collected from around the country at high schools and colleges. So I was giving a presentation to a bunch of athletic directors down on Long Island at Hofstra University. We're all sitting in the room, we're all talking about turf, and we're talking, we did everything. We were talking about grass and organics and you know, how to you know, make the, the surface more resilient, and we were talking about synthetic turf. And you know, one of the athletic directors raised his hand, he says, what are we doing about the burns on their feet? He says, I've got a daughter who plays, and she comes home. He says, we tape her feet now. You know, they have this kind of tape that they use for athletes. They use it for gymnasts, you know, that thick. They literally tape her feet so that she is, she is protected somewhat from the heat on those surfaces. A comprehensive study on the temperature of synthetic turf fields actually came out um, from Brigham Young University. The hottest field surface temperature recorded when they were doing the study at Brigham Young was 200 degrees Fahrenheit on a 98 degrees day. And even on cooler days, the field temperature of 120 degrees to 174 degrees were recorded. So in general, surface temperatures of synthetic turf is 37 degrees hotter than asphalt and 86 degrees hotter than natural grass. So we're talking now, if these fields are so hot, 
um, you're going to have to buy water cannons because it is really dangerous to allow your kids to play on fields that have those high temperatures. And so they sell you water cannons and you can literally try to cool down the field surface. You interrupt play, you have to cool down the field surface and it lasts for about 20 minutes. It'll cool it down by about 20 degrees, but it'll pop right back up within 20 minutes. And so you have to stop play again. You start again with the water cannons to cool down. So body fluid contaminations. Even when you have a synthetic turf field, you know, they love to come in and tell you, whoa, we're gonna put down the field and you never have to touch it. You don't have to do a thing. No pesticides, nothing, no maintenance. Just like everybody can play on this field 24 seven, it's gonna last for 10 years. That's the line that you get from the synthetic turf manufacturers. Um, the problem is that on athletic fields, you're gonna get body fluid contamination. Um, you're gonna get saliva, sweat, vomit, blood. It just happens. That's just what happens when you're playing sports. And so natural grass fields will actually take those body fluids, they'll be pulled down underneath the surface, and you're going to have these soil microbes in there that will actually break down naturally these pathogens that might be found in body fluid spills. Unfortunately, when you have plastic surfaces, they should, should be, and it is recommended, that they be disinfected after every game to ensure safety. But in practice, this is rarely, if ever, done. Rarely, if ever, done. Who's ever seen them spray a field down with with um, a disinfectant after a game. <laughs> Never, I mean, it just doesn't happen. But I mean, that is recommended. I mean, it's part of, you know, covering themselves, you know, from an insurance perspective, liability perspective, that you're supposed to do that because of body fluid spills. Injuries, um, NFL players have had it. They're like up to here with synthetic turf. I mean, 75% of NFL players feel that playing on synthetic turf increases soreness and fatigue, and they want to play on real grass. Um, and the other thing is injuries. Um, the injuries, uh, there's one in particular that is, that is absolutely um, distinct for synthetic turf play, and that's called turf toe. Anybody heard of turf toe? It's a sprain of the main joint of the big toe. Um, it's unique um, and it takes a long time to heal. It puts players out of, uh, you know, out of uh, play for a long time. Um, and they get, they, get, they get more serious joint injuries that take longer to heal as well. Um, chemical flame retardants. I don't care what kind of infill material you're going to use on a synthetic turf field. They are now putting disinfectants like triclosan into these fields, okay? And they are also putting flame retardants in because when you have crumb rubber, rubber burns really, really well, okay? And it burns for a long time and it's really hard to put it out. Um, and so we've had a lot of kids, you know, who have been burning fields, burning playground surfaces because it's just fun to do. I mean, it's fun to just light a match and watch that thing go up. So now, um, as an answer to this, the, uh, the industry is beginning to put um, PBDE, polybromated diphenyl ethers, which is a flame retardant. These are halogenated um, flame retardants that are being actually embedded in the plastic itself. They're persistent in the environment. They accumulate in our fatty tissue, especially breast milk of humans, through bi biomagnification and bioaccumulation. Um, then their main problems are endocrine disruption, which is thyroid function particularly um, for these class of chemicals and neurological impacts as well as them being possible human carcinogens. Um, I just want to say, I mean, I haven't covered every aspect of this issue, um, but I'm more than willing to try to answer any questions yet that you have a little bit later. But if you look at our children right now, this generation, the National Institutes of Health has said will have, for the first time ever, will have a shorter lifespan than their parents. This is because our children have many, many chronic diseases. If you look at the statistics, we have a 1% increase in childhood cancers every year for the past 25 years. So that's a 25% increase in childhood cancers. Um, it used to be that we would see leukemia in children and possibly brain tumors. And then, you know, so now we see everything. Every type of cancer that adults 
are diagnosed with we are often we are also seeing in children even at birth and then we have precocious puberty um, many of you know if you have young children um, that children are maturing um, they are maturing earlier than ever before um, this is all part of you know the chemicals in the environment that act as, as estrogen mimics or hormone disrupting chemicals um, so our children are, are really they're really the canaries in the coal mine they're saying there's really something wrong here um, in the environment that is, that is causing this. We really can't attribute very much of this increase in all of these illnesses and disabilities to genetic predisposition. Um, so we have to look somewhere else. And the only other place to look is the environment. And even the most conservative institutions in this country, health institutions, recognize that the environment plays a major role in all of these in all these problems that we're seeing in our children. So our feeling as an organization um, is that what we want to do, if we possibly can, is to reduce that burden on our children, not to continue to exacerbate and to add to that already, you know, um, unfortunate burden of chemical exposures that our children are dealing with every single day, uh, and so. I'm just incredibly grateful to all of you that you care enough about an issue like this. And you know, I could go on and talk about the environmental issue with, uh, with using a plastic field as opposed to real grass. I mean, we need grass right now. I mean, grass is, you know, is pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, synthetic turf fields are not. Um, synthetic turf fields are made from petroleum, a fossil fuel. Um, most of the chemicals that are in the crumb rubber infill are made from petroleum products, a fossil fuel. And we need to kind of, kind of get away from this. Wouldn't you rather have your child on a natural surface? I mean, just, just from a, um, I don't know, from a, a human uh, instinct, wouldn't you rather have your ch child playing on grass than playing on a piece of plastic with a bunch of chemicals in it? Mm -hmm.